In this video, I'm going to show you how I designed and built this CNC router without the use of any fancy tools and without having any previous experience on the subject. I'll go through why I built it, the design choices I made, the parts I bought, and the tools and methods that I used. I've always kind of wanted a CNC machine. They're super useful for making all kinds of things, but they're also really expensive, unless you get one of those cheap ones off the internet. But those are not exactly what I had in mind. They're small, underpowered, not very rigid, questionably reliable, and to be honest, I think I could build a better one myself. I mean, how hard could it be? But before we dive into that, let's take a moment to explain just what a CNC machine actually is and how it works. First of all, CNC stands for Computer Numeric Control. Basically, it's a milling machine that's run by a computer which drives motors to allow for precise and repeatable machining operations. It's capable of movements that are far more precise and consistent than any human can manage. How it works is, a cutting tool gets moved around in three or more axes by stepper motors that interpret instructions called G-code. Stepper motors are unlike regular DC motors. They don't just spin, they move in tiny increments called steps. This way, they can be told by the computer to turn very specific amounts. These motors are attached to a linear motion system, which converts their rotation into lateral motion. This is what physically moves the cutting tool through the material. The tool path that the machine follows is the resulting combination of the motion of the three axes. After doing some research, I began to understand some of the key features that make a CNC machine good or bad. I found that the power and rigidity are extremely important if you want to have any chance of cutting metal or even cutting wood at a reasonable speed. This is the main reason why I chose to use a screw-driven system instead of a belt-driven system, and it's also the reason why I chose to use supported rails on the X and Y axes. For this project, a big factor was budget. I wanted to keep the price down as much as I could, but I also didn't want to sacrifice quality. This is part of the reason why I chose to do it myself and not just buy a pre-built machine. I also thought that it would be a great learning experience. This turned out to be true, but it was also a case of information overload. Let's talk for a moment about tools. Mine kind of sucked, which was another limiting factor. But you gotta make the best out of what you have. The main tools that I used for this project are the following. An old miter saw, a cheap bench top drill press, a handheld drill, a belt sander, a metric drill and tap set, a few files, digital calipers, a tape measure, a steel punch tool for marking holes in the aluminum plates, and various screwdrivers and allen wrenches. So certainly nothing fancy or out of the ordinary. Now I would honestly say that if you can afford to pay someone to machine some of the important metal parts for you, uh, do that because it is very hard to get them done by hand, but it is possible with enough patience and determination. The first thing that I had to develop was a general idea of what kind of machine I wanted to build. Three axis, moving gantry, screw driven, and small enough to fit on a table or workbench, but big enough to produce some nice wood carvings. I decided not to use any pre-existing plans or schematics, so I did have to pretty much design all of the dimensions of the machine from the ground up. In order to do that, I needed some kind of CAD program. I found out about Autodesk Fusion 360 and decided to give that a go. I'd done regular 3D modeling before, but this was new to me. Fortunately, there are tons of great tutorials on YouTube, as usual. Also, there's a website called GrabCAD that has some dimensionally accurate models that users have already uploaded. I found some great ones to get me started on a few parts. That saved me some time. First, I had to figure out the exact dimensions of certain key components. Then I could extrapolate out the rest in order to fit everything together. I knew I was going to use a Makita RT0701C router as the spindle since they are widely available, affordable, and proven to work well on desktop CNC machines. Based on the options available to me, I chose to use 800mm rails for the Y-axis, 600mm rails for the X-axis, and a pre-built Z-axis linear assembly. This pretty much defined the size for the rest of the components, so I was able to use those and start designing in Fusion 360. I then bought a couple of appropriately sized ball screws for the X and Y axes. I found that the these parts could be readily attached to 6060 aluminum extrusion, which is quite rigid and much lighter and cheaper than solid aluminum. To attach components to the extrusion, I used 6mm metric bolts and T-slot nuts that fit perfectly into the grooves. For the gantry side plates that hold up the entire X-axis, I decided to use solid aluminum plate. I went to a local industrial surplus store and bought a large, roughly 3 8 inch thick plate for about 40 bucks. I was pretty worried about how cutting aluminum was going to go. I hadn't ever really done it before, and the idea of just chopping into it with a regular saw was pretty unnerving. But actually, it ended up working really well. It kind of went through it like butter. To be honest, I was really impressed. Now, cutting the aluminum plate was a bit of a different story. That took more effort. But I did get it done, despite using some, uh, questionable methods. In the meantime, I ordered this half-inch thick plate of aluminum and drilled holes in the proper positions to hold the X-axis linear rails. I then had to tap all of the holes for M6 bolts, as well as mark, drill, 
drill and tap holes in the ends of the plate that would attach it to the gantry side plates. I used an extra piece of aluminum I had to create a guide that would allow me to drill consistently space holes right into the ends of the plate. Remember how I said that I had bought that pre-built Z-axis assembly earlier? Well I did, but it wasn't ready to go right out of the box. The holes that had come pre-drilled in the back of it weren't necessarily in the right positions for the sliding blocks that would ride on the x-axis rails. So I had to drill some new ones, and I also had to tap them for M5 bolts. At this point, I put together all of the x-axis components I had built up to this point, and then I attached the z-axis assembly to that. I took the two plates that I had cut for the gantry sides and drilled two holes in them and bolted them together. This was so that I could file and sand them down to be the exact same size. This was very important since I had no other way to ensure consistency, given the basic tools I had to work with. I also kept them bolted together while I drilled all of the holes that would attach them to the sliding blocks and other components. I made a crossbar from another half-inch thick piece of aluminum that would run between the bottom edges of the gantry side plates. At the center of this bar, I mounted a bracket that would attach to the nut that runs back and forth on the y-axis ball screw. I also cut some short sections from the extrusion to act as legs that would lift the mainframe up off the ground, providing space for the y-axis screw and crossbar to travel back and forth. I made a mounting plate for the y-axis motor from the leftovers of the large aluminum plate I had bought for the gantry sides. After drilling some holes, I used it to attach the motor that would drive the y-axis ball screw to the frame. I also made similar plates to mount the y-axis screw to the bottom of the frame. For the x-axis motor, I needed some kind of standoff spacer thing because of the way the gantry side plates were so close to the end of the ball screw. Luckily, since I was using a standard size motor, I found someone selling just what I needed online. The z-axis was by far the easiest. The assembly that I had purchased already had holes drilled in the correct position for the size of motor that I was using. Lastly, I created some small mounting plates for the limit switches and attached them. After cutting all the aluminum extrusion parts, the gantry components, as well as the screw and motor mounting plates, I put everything together for a test fit. Then, once I was satisfied that it was going to work, I took it all back apart in order to sand and paint it. There was still one more important part left to make the spoil board. This piece is a replaceable machining surface that has threaded inserts which allow you to clamp down cutting stock. I made mine by cutting down a 3 quarter inch thick piece of MDF to fit on top of the machine's main frame. I bolted it down by using the same T-slot nuts used everywhere else on the extrusion. So at this point I basically had a really heavy paperweight. I could move the machine around by turning the screws by hand, but that was it. Time to bring it to life. Now, as I mentioned earlier, my machine, like most, uses stepper motors. I chose to go with NEMA 23s. NEMA is a standard motor profile size. The cross-section on all NEMA 23s, for example, is the same, but you can get different lengths, with longer models usually having more torque. So obviously, I went with the most powerful one I could find, 425 ounce inches, because I didn't know how much I actually needed, so I figured the more the better. I bought a kit from Stepper Online that had three motors, three drivers, and a 36 volt power supply unit. With the motors installed, it was time to start wiring up the electronics. Now, as I mentioned earlier, the motors are controlled by driver boards, but there has to be some kind of intermediary control board that translates and distributes commands from the computer. Enter the Arduino Uno. The reason I chose this for the control board is that the units themselves are very cheap, the firmware that runs on it is free, and they're pretty easy to get set up and running. Before I could finish wiring everything up, I needed some sort of case that I could put all the electronic components into. I wanted to design it in such a way that I could easily disconnect it from the machine in order to more easily change out parts if I needed to. I found an old DVD player for sale that had a nice metal enclosure and a working 12 volt power supply inside. I gutted everything out of the box except the power supply. I then figured out where everything needed to sit and drilled some holes to start mounting all the new parts. In order to create the panel that would house the plugs for the cables that went to the machine, I made a small aluminum plate that would mount in the open area of the box that was left vacant when I removed the DVD drive. Into this plate, I mounted six female end four pin connectors, as well as an on off switch and a single barrel jack power connector. Three of the four pin connectors were for the motor cables and the other three were for the limit switches. The barrel jack I connected to the 12 volt power supply that I mentioned earlier. The purpose of this was to provide power for an LED strip that I mounted on the machine in order to better see its progress while it was running. I also had to make a small hole at the back of the case for the power plug, which was just a standard PC power supply type. I installed the 36 volt power supply, the three drivers, the Arduino, and a small opto isolator board for the switches. I also connected some small fans to the secondary power supply to keep all the electronics cool. Okay, I realize that wiring job is far from pretty, but give me some slack. It was my first time. I better explain how all this mess works. For each motor, there is a step, direction, and enable input, each controlled by the Arduino. The enable inputs are all tied together since obviously we want them all enabled. The step or pulse pin 
tells the motor to take a step and the direction pin tells it which direction to turn. Each driver has a power input coming from the 36 volt power supply and two power output lines going to the two different phases of the motor. These four wires are what go to the connector plugs at the front of the box. The limit switches are also connected to the Arduino and tell the machine when it has reached its home position as well as serving to prevent it from moving beyond its physical bounds. I wired these through the aforementioned opto isolator circuit with the hope that it would eliminate some of the noise from the switch wires. It's worth noting that the best way to wire these switches is in the normally closed configuration since this means that if anything happens to disturb the switches or break the wires the machine would stop. Outside of the box there was more work to do. I designed the motor connections in such a way that they could be easily unplugged and swapped out if need be by using terminal blocks for the contacts. From there I ran wires up to the plugs that connected to the control box. Now I'd originally used some cheap four conductor cable that I found on Amazon but unfortunately the low price came with some complications. I didn't realize this at first, but when the machine became bogged down under a heavy load, the increased power draw must have been creating noticeable electromagnetic interference, which was getting picked up somewhere in the limit switch lines and causing a false positive. This caused the machine to stop sometimes, but eventually I replaced all of the motor and switch wiring with shielded microphone cables, which seems to have solved the issue. All of the motor limit switches, lighting, and router power cords were routed through drag chain units on the X and Y axes to keep them tidy, and more importantly, out of the way of the cutting tool. After a few more finishing touches, like 3D printed caps for the extrusion, it was time for final assembly. And then, the build was complete. Now, it was time to get machining. Uh, actually, not quite. First, I had to install gerbil. Or... gerbil or GRBL, or however it's pronounced, on my Arduino. Then I had to install Universal G-Code Sender on my laptop to make sure all the settings were correct. Now this video is getting a bit long already, so I'm gonna skip the explanation on how to do this. There's already many great tutorials on YouTube. With the computer and Arduino programs set up and ready to go, the first machining job was to make some holes in the spoil board. These would hold the threaded inserts. First, I determined the maximum cutting area and then created a two by two inch grid within it. On each point of the grid, I created a hole big enough for the insert. These were actually actually mounted from what would be the underside of the board, so I had to flip the MDF over and mill them out. I used a quarter inch two flute end mill. First I installed each of the threaded inserts using a handheld drill with a hexagonal driver bit. Then I flipped the board back over and bolted it in its final position. I used a one inch facing bit in order to flatten it down so that it was perfectly parallel to the end of the cutting tool. Okay, now it was actually time to get machining. I did a few simple test cuts like shapes and outlines of letters, just to make sure that I had the machine working properly. Then I moved on to more complex designs and more three-dimensional carbon. There was a lot of tweaking and experimentation to find the right settings in order for the machine to not only run smoothly, but also cut at the right dimensions. And I'm sure there's still many ways that it could be improved. There's one more thing I do need to touch on, the enclosure I built for the machine. Basically, it's just a big box made out of acrylic and wood, but I do consider it a pretty important addition. Without this, the machine makes a huge mess flinging dust and wood chips everywhere. It also has the added benefit of dampening the sound of the router, so I'd highly recommend building one of these. And now I'd like to show you some of the awesome things that I've made using this machine. So as you can see, the machine does a great job of carving wood, and it can even do some light-duty aluminum work. I'm really proud of how this came out, even though it's far from perfect. After all, I'm not an engineer, I'm just a guy who likes making things. I really tried to keep this video short and to the point, so there's a lot of things that I had to gloss over. In reality, it took me almost a year to get this thing built and running properly. Anyway, I hope you found this video useful, or at least interesting, if you're thinking about building a similar project. If you have any questions or suggestions for me, be sure to leave them in the comments below. And if you did enjoy the video, please consider subscribing. Thanks, and I'll see you next time.